Uh, good evening, everyone. Namaste. We're going to get started. It's 5.30 p.m. Uh, uh, Indian Standard Time. Good morning to our colleagues in the United States. Uh, good evening to our colleagues in uh, Asia. Good afternoon to our colleagues in Europe. Today is a very special day because today we are organizing the first of what we believe is going to be an exciting session, uh, reaching out to the generation next of Indian doctors, the future of Indian healthcare. My name is Anupam Sibyl. I am the Group Medical Director of Apollo Hospitals and the President of GAPIO. GAPIO is the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, which was established in 2011 with the objective of bringing together 1.4 million physicians of Indian origin across the globe on one platform. As we start this session, I'd like to invite Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam for his opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam is the Chairman and CEO of Columbia Asia Hospital Group. He's a very well-known surgeon. He's had, he's had a wonderful career and has held a very important positions in healthcare, including uh, heading the NABH that is responsible for accreditation of hospitals in India. Currently, Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam is the Vice President of GAPIO. Over to you, Dr. Nand Kumar. Thank you, Anupam. And it's a pleasure to be here in the midst of youngsters who are going to shape the future of Indian healthcare. I must congratulate Anupam and the team for having worked towards establishing this program because this program will allow us as a group of Indian physicians to really understand the minds and aspirations of the next generation. This is indeed important for the next generation's mind will be the way in which the efficiency, capability and healthcare delivery of this country will occur. I think understanding their mind and what their aspirations are will allow GAPIO to set about establishing the kinds of training, information dispersal, and so on, which will enable the younger generation to benefit. I believe GAPIO is also a fantastic platform to teach the next generation on certain soft skills that are so important in the conduct of healthcare and medical science. Compassion, understanding what a person requires in terms of advice, not necessarily clinical advice, but advice of every kind is indeed important. It also is important for us to remember that a large portion of our country consists of people who are underserved in healthcare and underprivileged to access it. And uh, enabling their health is indeed an important aspect that each one of us has to commit ourselves to. Therefore, I would say I am very, very pleased to see this platform. And Anupam, thank you so much for organizing it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nankumar Jairam, for your encouraging words. And I'm sure that our uh, medical students today are going to benefit from the immense wisdom that is going to be shared with them. We're going to start off by inviting Dr. Molly Mehta. Uh, Molly is uh, finally a medical student in Ahmedabad. Uh, she's very active in trying to get Indian medical students studying in India and those studying overseas of Indian origin to come onto one platform. She feels very passionately about human rights, reproductive health, and is currently the Vice President External Affairs of the Medical Students Association of India. Over to you, Molly, to give us a perspective from the medical students' point of view. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I would firstly uh, like to thank the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin for inviting me to be a part of such a lovely panel. And good evening to all the panelists here and to all the participants who took the time out to be a part of this panel discussion. Uh, with that, it is a pleasure for me to give my perspective and my individual opinion of medical students over the future of Indian healthcare. We have more than 479 medical schools comprising of around 67,228 medical students and counting. 
it's an enormous number isn't it and there wouldn't be a much perfect time to say this that the world around us is changing and it is being tremendously difficult for us to keep pace with it one of the reasons i believe uh, of us not able to keep the pace is the coping mechanism the coping mechanism and the system which is not being able to change around us the pace at which the medical education system the curriculum the uh, assessment system the examination is changing it's maybe not enough and it is not maybe in the direction of the holistic development of of us as future healthcare professionals when i say this i say this with pride that medical students are the protagonists of the indian healthcare system of the future every individual who is related to the medical fraternity is playing a significant role but it is these medical students who are contributing to the skeleton of the sculpture of the healthcare of future of the future are playing a very very vital role my opinion in terms of changing the system is that the only and only way to change to to change the system is by knowing it the more closely the more intimately you know the system the more you will be able to shape the future and in order to change our current system one of the ways is through experimentation that experimentation can be in the form of advocacy research innovation there are so many forms of experimenting it and i and i'm and these forms of experiment they clearly play as a catalyst in terms of evolving the system and in terms of evolving ourselves as to be better future healthcare professionals along with these experiments it's it's them who help us in honing and developing our skills such as the communication skills leadership skills team building skills and in turn help us in taking this step towards a holistic approach i would like to conclude by saying that uh, as there's a saying which goes that you learn the hard way and don't you think the pandemic is the pandemic is exactly teaching us that it is such webinars it is such discussions which help medical students to form this perspective and to take their step towards experimentation i hope to see the change which all of us are yearning for and which all of us are working towards for very soon and for it to be reflected transparently and clearly in the healthcare system of the future thank you so much again for inviting me to be a part of this panel and for me and for and and helping me to put my opinion forth thank you so much again thank you so much molly it's very heartening to hear experimentation research having an open mind transparency the need for every medical student to understand that we need to go beyond clinical medicine to understand leadership communication skill and the kind of world that we live in today which is borderless and we need to learn from each other thank you so much molly i'm now going to invite uh, shubham anand shubham is also a final year medical student a very prolific uh, has already demonstrated leadership skills by organizing several events Uh, he organized the web medquest which was india's largest virtual medical conference that we were a part of uh, he has established the global association of indian medical students and is currently heading it uh, over to you uh, shubham to give us your opinion on how covid-19 has impacted medical students over to you shubham first of all thank you anupam sir for your kind words and good evening everyone it's like an absolute honor for me to share the platform with legends of our fraternity like dr pratap reddy sir dr anupam sikpal sir sudhir parik sir ak tandan sir <clears throat> and other dignitaries since past 6 months india is battling the pandemic and it has uh, affected all sections of the society it has resulted in complete disorientation of all sections of the society and the medical field is not immune but i will stick to the point that being a medical student what concerns me the most uh, the shifting of teaching from offline to online may have like contributed to some extent to the theory part but uh, the clinical learning that has been vastly affected and that is definitely going to have a far sighted consequences on the society like even if the college reopens in the coming times 
uh, clinical le learning will still still suffer as many medical colleges have turned into covid dedicated hospitals and opds are not fully functional we are glad that gapio always stand stand behind the medical student and supports the initiatives and also promote e learning like they, uh, they during the whole pandemic they have done a range of webinars for covid 19 they are also going to have one on vaccine and they have promoted e learning on a huge level gapio has a strong network and a big connection of with the policy makers like the national medical commission the niti aayog dnb health ministry central government and all the decision makers particularly so what the medical fraternity it has a it can benefit a lot from gapio by having the support like the medical students fraternity could raise their voice and concerns to appropriate authorities and get our voice be heard like that is more important like today is uh, not a, a time for dharnas and all we need to act smart we need to be smart we need our, if we need our voices to be heard we need to go through proper channels and we need to approach in a right perspective and by having the support of uh, connections which gapio has it will help the medical student fraternity to get the voice be heard i also propose gapio to start including medical students as their associate members maybe at a nominal fee and once they complete their internship they can become a full time member because we are the gen x doctors and by summit by supporting us in our budding stages by uh, supporting us in our times we could also enlarge in the membership base of gapio medical medical students can develop a great bond if they can do complimentary observation in any apollo hospitals closest to their homes like this young doctors depending on their knowledge skills and performance can also meet the requirement of junior medical staff in apollo hospitals like it is a much known fact that apollo hospital is the largest hospital group in india with more than 10000 uh, beds to their capacity so the medical students can benefit a lot by getting observership in any of the apollo hospitals and what apollo could also benefit is like uh, they will get a vast pool of talents they will get a vast pool of skilled uh, uh, junior medical staff that could benefit uh, that could be like of mutual benefit i expect that this collaboration will have far sighted mutual benefit and it can go on to be a game changer for the fraternity and global association of physician of indian origin i expect that they continue giving us such platform and opportunities through which we could also contribute our part to the society the foundation is late today and i am sure that the continued support of gapio will def, uh, through the continued support of gapio we will continue uh, going on and achieve a lot thank you sir thank you very much uh, shubham uh, for your remarks and you make a very important point about how we can support you and let me respond by saying that in our executive committee which met Uh, a few weeks ago this issue came up and with the permission of uh, dr reddy our founder president and uh, all the distinguished members of the executive committee we decided that we will start associate membership for all the medical students and uh, of course more information will be shared by this and anyone who is interested can reach out either to molly or to shubham or to dr tandon send us a email and we will uh, make you a part of our uh, organization and when you qualify Uh, as doctors then automatically we will encourage you to apply and become a full member uh, there are numerous benefits that will come to you whether it's about mentorship whether it's about someone hand holding you guiding you answering your queries it's very important in life to have someone who can guide you who's been there who has a wealth of experience to show you the way uh, this is really really useful and perhaps maybe at age 22 you don't realize but much later in life you realize how important it is to have a mentor who can actually guide you and help you create a, a road map for your future and and gapio will be very happy to do that we want each one of our medical students to become uh, medical leaders of tomorrow and that's why we are here today discussing this with you uh, thank you shubham it is now uh, a privilege for me to introduce uh, dr pratap uh, c reddy uh, chairman of bolo hospitals group the founder of bolo hospitals group and the founder president of gapio 
I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Reddy now for 23 years. I have spent a lot of time with him interacting uh, with Dr. Reddy on a very regular basis. And I have to say that the virtues, the values, the qualities that define great leadership, I have seen at close quarters in my interaction with Dr. Reddy. And let's look at some of those values. Humility. Gandhiji had said that the first virtue that an individual must possess uh, to become a leader is humility. Humility sets the stage for other virtues to, to appear. And it has been said that a great man shows his greatness in how he treats the little men. And I have seen how Dr. Reddy, uh, through his humility, uh, makes everyone feel special. It doesn't matter who you are, anyone he comes in contact with gets that sense of warmth and that sense of importance that he attaches to everyone he interacts with. Courage. Uh, when Dr. Eddy started talking about setting up, creating the first private hospital in India, that required a lot of courage. And he's demonstrated that year after year, decade after decade with taking on new initiatives. The determination to follow through. Uh, Dr. Eddy has said many times that if there are a million bricks in our first hospital, Apollo, Chennai, Greensland, that there were a million problems that he had to face as he established that hospital. Dr. Reddy likes to dream and he likes to dream big. And what is very uh, interesting and positive about Dr. Reddy's approach to dreaming is that he encourages others to dream. So if you have an idea and you go to Dr. Reddy, the answer always is going to be, let's explore this. Yes, we can do it. It's never been a no. He has such an open mind to look at things differently, to give everyone an opportunity to present their point of view. And it is because of that openness that we are able to, uh, and we have at Apollo been able to uh, bring about the change that Dr. Lee, Dr. Reddy wanted and has demonstrated over 37 years. Uh, Dr. Reddy is recognized as the architect of uh, uh, modern corporate healthcare in India. And there are many awards that have come his way from being the CNBC, CNN, NDTV, um, um, Leader of the Year, the Asia Pacific Leadership Award, and of course, the Padam Bhushan and the Padam Vibhushan. I'm now going to invite Dr. Reddy to join this discussion. And the format is that I'm going to be asking Dr. Reddy a few questions, and we're going to ask Dr. Reddy to comment uh, after he answers those questions. And then we are going to open it up to all the medical students to be able to ask questions. So a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you very much. I think since we are all here, first thing that we should see is to give our word of appreciation for all the medical professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the, the pharmacists, the, the entire medical profession who really stood by when this pandemic struck. You know, the whole world was struck with this. I remember when they announced what the government did, you know, is, is sh shutting down and then trying to see where they can get the PPEs, where they can get the ventilator and how they ever going to do all of this. But now looking back six months, I admire the entire medical profession, whether it is a government or private, I think all of them deserve our great appreciation for what they've done during a crisis which we have never seen anything like it in a lifetime. You know, in 65 years as a doctor, I've never seen anything of this nature. So I think we need to pay our respects to those who did this marvelous job. And to people in India, we should say doubly proud. Because very many people thought, you know, why do they have this technology? Why do they have the wherewithal to face that such huge crisis? I must say, way they have treated, and if you analyze the figures, the, the care that people had, whether it's in a government facility or in a private facility, it was remarkable. So it, it shows because if you look at the, the mortality, you know, initially it was close to 3%. They brought it down to close to 1.7%. And we run a hospital government first time a government hospital in the district, Chito, is run by our medical college. They, they have about 250 COVID beds in that 758 hospital. The mortality there has come down 
following Anupam continuously sends for the entire group a red book the, the rules as you quite saying what is the antibiotic what is the line of treatment that you need what are the new drugs that are available how will it act what what we should not touch and all of these 20 versions i think he has given every bit of it followed across all of our 71 hospitals plus two of the medical college hospital so i'm glad to say the mortality in the chitur hospital is less than 1% it speaks so well of an indian doctor if he takes up saying the challenge i think he is second to none i'm happy to uh, i'm not saying that we have someone to be uh, voting us but to say in such a severe crisis that they all stood up for this thank you all i think we 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 sincerely want to appreciate the effort of all of the people across the world when people are panicked in our home the doctors the nurses the paramedics the way they work to save lives across the world and i am very happy that uh, the for the first time we are having the global uh, medical students association also and uh, the page both of them spoke is excellent i think there is a great scope that they will evolve, evolve better than the previous doctors because things are changing and the change is now seen now i think everyone is talk about post covid as 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 i don't know if you all know this uh, second decade of the 21st century the world economic forum first said that 80% of the deaths in this decade will be from ncds you know what ncds are the diabetes the heart and the strokes and the cancer and infections and then they said second thing that the cost burden for the world will be 30 trillion dollars and for india it will be 3.8 trillion dollars even on the money part of it but who are the people who are going to die in india these are the people between 30 and 50 who are the family breadwinners the family is going to lose them the corporate is going to lose them the nation is going to be deprived of these people so i think this is what we did uh, you know the later part of last year before the decade came saying how do we groom ourselves to say that will disprove what world economic forum said saying that this many deaths will not happen and this kind of expenditure we cannot afford india cannot afford 3.8 billion dollars which is more than 50% of the gdp so this is why we did many things and some of it came it as a great asset in managing the today's uh, huge crisis the first most important thing is we started what's called the 24 into 7 app so that anybody from anywhere can contact a doctor you know there about put up for 6000 plus doctors more than 4000 doctors participated in it you could ask saying if you have some symptoms to say is this covid and he will answer you and tell you what exactly you need to take the next step but if it's only some other thing he will order you some tests the test will be carried out from apollo people will come and do the test and the drugs will reach your house so this is apollo 24 into 7 which was started to alleviate the you know the huge threat that we were without we were faced from ncds similarly i think you know there are three things that uh, the second decade of 21st century was supposed to give to healthcare artificial intelligence and automation robotics and uh, uh, cd uh, printing so in we we called a global tender and finally we selected a uh, british company called dxc what they have done the first thing they have done is uh, they uh, we have done the world's largest number of health checks i did it before apollo and called it mass health check up then i had a friend of mine from us one pathologist was with me a dear friend of mine we sat together and wrote the first health check up today we have done over 22 million health check ups so the artificial intelligence people they analyze all of these now they have made out of this what called the personalized health check we are calling that as pro health which we did for ncds so we thought if we pick the disease early if you pick saying a person is liable for heart attack you can cure him 
you can mend him. You won't get a heart attack at 35. He'll probably get at 75 and probably still live. But similarly with the strokes and more important in the cancer. So this is where we have done that. So I, I'm very happy that we, we acted before uh, this COVID came and some of those have become a great uh, tool for, for what we are doing today. Um, I must thank, thank Anandak Bhagdaram, Deepa, Deepa Rik, uh, and of course Anupam who always does extraordinary things, ordinary well. Thank you. Sir. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. And then, you know, for the benefit of the medical students, see, Dr. Reddy made some very, very key points about, you know, when, when we were training, for us, it was all about communicable diseases. It was all about dying from infections. Now it is about 10 years ago, the deaths due to non-communicable diseases overtook infectious diseases. And that's very important because for you, it'll be non-communicable diseases. Dr. Reddy talked about machine learning. He talked about automation. He talked about digitalization. He talked about virtual care. He talked about artificial intelligence and these are really going to be the way you're going to function not the way we were trained so i'm not going to start off and actually take dr reddy back to his days when he was deciding what he wanted to do so i want to ask you why did you choose medicine why medicine why not accountancy architecture engineering something else you know you are supposed to uh, simply try to follow the trust of your father my father went on insisting saying you better do business and uh, I could see the love my mother was giving. So I thought I should uh, uh, you know, follow my mother. We say, you know, Mata, Pita, Gurudeva, Hita. So I followed the Mata first. So this is why, to please him, I joined the uh, honors in education management. But uh, medical admissions came, then I applied for it. Fortunately, I was one of those who got selected. and. Uh, the rest is history. And my father knew only after two years that I was still doing medicine and not doing the management course. So he was very happy inside that when I told him, I followed you know, mother's uh, inst instinct. So that was 70 years ago, Dr. Reddy. Uh, tell us about your MBBS days. I mean, they must have been so different. What do you remember the most about your MBBS days? I am not like these uh, young people here. I've got great talent with them. Those days we really went saying, whether it's a medical student or a, what you call the Pachapas College students, I will tell you, it's not properly right. In Madras, there are five colleges which are noted differently with different notation. The Presidency College was called College for Gentlemen. The Pachapas College uh, was supposed to be College for Rowdies. Lila College, the Christian you know, College, is called for gentlemen. So like that, all, all of these, you know, we had a combination of all of these together. So I think it was very wonderful to, to get this mix. And this is where I, I enjoyed because even when I was at Christian College and my pre-medical, I had the opportunity of forming what's called an association, art association. So I had the mix of all of these. So I could see there are so many things within us which are shut off because it's just because to, to, to study. We need to study, but I think we need to explore saying, how do we get along with, with, with other colleagues? What can we get out, out of them? Uh, not only in studies, in games, in all other perspectives. I'm happy to say, if just when I was in third year, the first medical exhibition in the country or in the world in, in the hospital was done when I was the joint secretary of the college. So I think it's, uh, that, that was a great, first nobody came. I invited the press saying, please come and visit the press, but don't write if you don't want to. But the whole page was full of that. And uh, we extended 10 days. Today they run every year, the Stanley, I was the only Stanley student and Madras Medical, these two were rivals. So I said, don't compete, you do it in alternate years. Like that, I think I participated in everything. Basically, we are in medicine. We need to get through the, the, the studies part of it. I did. My extracurricular activities did not deprive me from not becoming a medical student. So I did that too. And plus, this is where I think uh, the greater strength I had 
because I knew more people uh, who had greater talents than us, and this is where we can learn mutually from each other. But I think in medicine, as you see, year one to year five, four and a half or five years, whatever it is, I think there's a tremendous way of picking up things as you as you grow up in each of these years. But the fact that you mix with the final year student when you are in third year itself, automatically you have that feeling saying, the pride that he has having, you will have that pride saying, I'm happy I'm doing medicine. I think that should come. Once that is there in you, there's nothing that stops you in becoming a good medical student and later on a doctor. And a doctor that day was to become a good doctor. Today, you are talking about a high-tech, high-tech doctor. Uh, Dr. Reddy, you know, you talked about learning from colleagues, say, who are doing arts or science or, or history or philosophy. Uh, when I was, and I've read your biography, The Healer, multiple times, and there is this, this chapter, and I've always been intrigued, and I've never had the opportunity to ask you this question, so I'm going to ask this on behalf of all the medical students. Is it true that you saw the film, The Million Pound Note, 51 times? 51 times you went to cinema to watch a film? You are not taking me back to 1951. 1951 in the year I joined, and there was a theater close to us. And uh, this film is wonderful. It is wonderful in two ways. It's a short film, it's one hour, 10 minutes film. But uh, you felt so powered when you saw that. And here is a guy who said this is a million pound note and could get, get everything in life from a simple coffee to a great uh, dinner and throw a party and buy what he wanted, including a castle. So I think that is a power that you acquire and when you are able to say, I have uh, grit. I won't say gut, I think it's a grit that uh, million pound not have. And each time I went, I had something else which grabbed me. I don't know if that, uh, I'm sure that played some part uh, in my building up as what, what, what I am today. But I think it's a wonderful thing. All of you must see it. We will see that. that. And and I think take a leaf from your book in, and these days there's so many opportunities of watching some really inspirational films, reading inspirational books, because it's, as they say, who you are five years from now is going to be determined by the friends you keep and the books you read. So I think the access to, to that knowledge is always uh, a huge asset. Now, Dr. Reddy, you, we, we interacted with two very bright, young, dynamic organizers. And, and there is this incident when you try to organize a conference and you had to make a speech and, and, you know, you once mentioned that. So just tell us about that speech and what did you learn from that speech? You want to share me before all the international <laughs> people, and the, the happy, the happy, and the medical students to all think, well, it's okay. And one of the anniversary days, we made great arrangements. It was a two and a half hours program. Then uh, uh, Governor General of India, Algoparajari became the chief minister of Madras after, you know, after holding that high post in, in someone for it, particularly they appointed him. So I invited him for the function. So he came and he enjoyed, you know, because truly it was a wonderful function. Everybody uh, had a great time. And when I went to the mic, uh, I said, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, and uh, repeated it. I couldn't say, uh, anything because I had what's called the stage fear. When I saw all of them in that buoyant mood, uh, my mind gave, had a developed a mental block. So I went to the car and then he told me, Dr. Reddy, you organize such a beautiful function. You must be a capable person. But in any case, I want to see you in the morning, six o'clock, please come to my house, uh, CM's house. I went there, he told only one thing. He said, whatever you wanted to tell last evening, you go back to your uh, room, go to the toilet, and say what you wanted to say last evening. I think, Graeme, from that day till the, today, I don't know what is stage fear. Whatever I have, I will be able to come, come out of it. So I think that is, I should thank, you know, uh, Governor General, Adhikopalachari, 
great scholar person you all know him. I mean, we all would have known about, uh, heard about him, but he's a super person as an individual. What, what a powerful example for each one of us to learn, fight the worries that we have and, and overcome them. And you were fortunate to have done that at a very young age. Sometimes people struggle at a much older age where, you know, the fears take, uh, you know, consume them and, and, and uh, you know, do not allow them to, to move on with something that they are so passionate about. So you did your MBBS from India and then you decided to go to England and then you decided to, the U, to go to the US. Why did you want to go abroad? What, what was the reason? What was the compulsion? You want me to tell the truth? Of course. In India and then and now, we have this what is called a quota system. So I appeared for my MD selection. So the, everything went off well. I thought I did well. When the results came, my name did not appear on the board. I went to the dean and I asked him. He said, Dr. Reddy, I don't know why you came because the quota today was only for the backward community. And for those who are in the government service, you don't belong to one of those. But I must tell you, you did very well. That was no satisfaction. So that's the day I applied saying to, to go to US that uh, for the exam. I, I filled up that form and paid the fee. And uh, a few weeks later, I thought, why don't I go to UK? So I went to UK. I was there for about five months or six months. Suddenly, I heard uh, many of my uh, colleagues, they were all studying very hard. I said, what's the matter? He said, you know, we're applying for this uh, US uh, 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 exam, entrance exam to uh, US. So I said, I've also applied. So I sent a telegram to Pittsburgh. So they sent back saying, this is your, this telegram. You know, those days, there was no, it's only a telegram. They sent the telegram said, you can use this as your hall ticket. I studied that few days, went to the exam. The wonderful thing is, along with me, one of our senior registrars, who is an Irish guy, who also came with me, was a dear friend of mine, and he was a race goer with me. So he, he also came, for, wrote the exam, and uh, I got through the exam, and he failed. You know in what he failed? He failed in English. An Irishman failed in English. So this is what... Uh, it can. So I think you should not take everything very seriously. You must say, I can do it and you will do it. Because if you have the fear of it, obstacles will come. There's no obstacle. There is no pressure of uh, getting anything, anything done. And the rest was history. And I went there. I went first to the, uh, in, in Massachusetts. I went to Mount Vernon. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, I'm uh, sorry, Worcester, Worcester City. It is supposed to be the smallest uh, uh, town with the largest number of millionaires. But uh, it was a very wonderful place for very first year. We had a great time. Then I became chief resident here. Then uh, when I had to apply, I applied to several institutions, including Mass General. I was not selected. But fortunately, the Vietnam War was going on. The, because if they had mass general, it was very, very difficult. They could nominate the one, two, three, four, five, whoever joined mass general. But Bhavati, you know, seen the most cardiologist, was a fellow of, uh, of mass general. So fortunately for me, uh, the person who was selected got went to Vietnam, was selected for the, to go as a veteran, uh, for, to fight the war. Then. My professor immediately said, I got a call. You go and prepare for the interview. I think you have a good chance of getting it. So I went there. The next was history. I became a fellow in the Mass General Hospital. So that was uh, completely changed what my whole life was. So such a powerful example, again, a great learning. Just because the first door doesn't open means nothing. I mean, if that door had perhaps opened in Chennai, you wouldn't have gone to England, you wouldn't have gone to America, you wouldn't have gone to Mass General, you wouldn't have done cardiology. And, you know, it's, it's like one disappointment shouldn't really stop us from, from dreaming. And you were doing really well in the US. And then what made you come back? Because nobody really came back in the 70s. Everyone who went in the 60s and 70s never came back. Why did you decide to come back? 
it's not that never came back say you came back i had a good reason you know i was having good life with me and uh, they were doing well in, in their schools or whatever uh, but uh, there's one thing which uh, my father loved cars i remember i broke one of his cars uh, trying to drive at the age of 10 uh, to 15 or 14 but uh, he loved cars so every time i bought a new car I used to send a picture. Uh, one day, I sent a picture with my new beautiful car, putting all of my four children on it, and uh, he replied. His usual reply was, "He will tell the agent to write to convey his uh, good wishes to me." That day, he penned it himself, saying, "There are two people who enjoy whatever you are doing there, but if you can give that joy and pleasure for people at home, how will that be?" He never said, "Come back." he only put that in me saying can you do something back for people at home i never had, i looked at my chair wife my wife said i think we should go fortunately my four daughters they are not like these two lovely girls here three girls to the other i'm seeing they they were too young they won't protest so they so we all came back the next uh, and i gave them my resignation and uh, when i saw that practice everybody was uh, astonished that uh, when i was just picking up and doing well to do this he said yes there is a purpose and i think there is something that we can do when your parents say they mean something so it is uh, when i came back there was nothing here you know there was not even there was one electric ecg machine uh, in the college which was locked up there was another ecg machine another hospital there two ecg machines there was nothing else was there so i started my practice uh, by importing everything else everything from on that day and the god's grace the practice went up there so i think uh, uh, in I, i i think as a cardiologist when i practiced for nearly uh, 15 years in india i did justice to myself and did gave me a lot of happiness that i could bring things to our country and but unfortunately those days whenever they needed surgery there was no acceptable surgery program dr denton puri was a dear friend of mine he and dr floyd look from cleveland uh, clinic were very dear friends of mine so i used to uh, ask him and whenever i had a patient i used to send our president dr del singh went there our chief minister went there nasimara our prime minister went there all of these people but one of those days in 78 i had one of my young man 38 year old who did not respond to medical treatment i wanted him to go to you uh, to dental coding unfortunately he came back in december and uh, i couldn't save him and i saw an young boy 31 year old with a 5 year old daughter 2 year old son absolutely stunned i thought to myself how many more are going to die you know why if he died he could raise 50000 dollars those days so i said how many more are going to die why should they die if indians are doing far excellent overseas why can't they do here so this firm belief i had i said when i was there i think i'm well good as sudeep parek if you ask him he say i am as good or better than the most of the people that, that are around me practice in my discipline so this is the truth but what was needed was a total transformation because the hospital was not recognized for anything so and i thought everybody who i knew including my own uh, samadhis my daughter's house, father in law uh, used to tell me doctor really uh, patap you did the first foolish thing by coming back second foolish thing you got such a great practice now why are you thinking of this and wasting your time it was not easy to go to delhi meet the ministers meet the secretary but most importantly meet the most terrible uh, bureaucrats you know the lower division clerk will say i'm busy come after 3 days i go every day to the state 
come back every semester that day. It was not easy. But I think I would say God's grace. I could get the first first hospital was done. When the first finance minister was uh, from Madras, he promised me he'll sanction as a special case, a loan for hospital, first hospital in Chennai. Fortunately, he couldn't do it because then the another secretary wrote, you will be impeached because this is not under the financial act. So he, he couldn't do. My good luck was he went to defense. Pranab Bukherjee came as the finance minister, the finance minister, the president of India. Pranab Mukherjee became the finance minister. I went to him a second time and he called the finance secretary and he said, why are you refusing? He said, this is not allowed. If it's not allowed, if I don't do this, are you going to prove that I'm an inefficient finance minister of India? He got a shock. He said, sir, 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 what, what? He said, you know, this concept is like to everybody. That he wants to see that he want to bring the level of care that's available for people you know, overseas back to our people, train our doctors, train our team to bring this. So that man grabbed my hand, said, Mr. Marotha, the finance secretary, dictated four lines, saying I am allowed to borrow 50% from bank, 50% at foreign exchange. That was the birth of my first hospital in Chennai in September 18, 19. 83. Then President, I went to the Prime Minister first to request her to inaugurate the hospital. She said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, Madam, why are you refusing? You are so helpful of the all this time. You like this concept of reversing your brain dead and all this. And she said, they think that I have done it and not you. So you go and ask the President if he'll inaugurate. I went to the President with my half knowledge of Hindi and his half knowledge of English. We got together and finally he said, okay, acha karenge. So the first hospital came in Madras on that day. I think we never saw us and the second time. We're today 71 hospitals, but it's not my 71 hospital. It is allowed over 5,000 private facilities that they have come up. In the last three decades, 80% of the beds that were added in the country are all because of the act that has been passed on that day by then uh, uh, the Prime Minister. When they, then they amended the financial act. That's what uh, made all this happen. I must also tell you how that act was changed. I wrote a letter to the, the next Prime Minister, Sri Rajiv Gandhi, later Sri Rajiv Gandhi. I wrote saying, I wish I had done a BD factory, a beer factory, in some healthcare. If health has to come along with your vision for 21st century, I need one, two, three, four. Number one, first hospital should be funded like any other trade or industry. Second thing I said, if somebody gets sick, he has to, his friend or his wife has to look after where he should go, how they fund it. If he has the insurance, he'll take the insurance. That was the second thing. So when he called me back, he said, is this okay you write a letter to the Prime Minister? Four lines? I said, I understand this Prime Minister doesn't read long letters. So he put there three weeks. On the 18th day I was called. And he passed the act uh, saying hospitals are allowed funding by the government banks. I think that is the one which brought all this transition that we are seeing in India today. The clinics, the diagnostic center, the clinics, the hospitals, primary, secondary, tertiary, quarterly hospital, all these it took out thanks to that great prime minister, Sri Raju Gandhi, who in spite of saying, is this a way you write a letter? I got a note saying, he's, will you want to come? He's presenting your bill tomorrow. I went there, I was sitting at the gallery. I got a chit saying, he's asking you to join him for lunch. When I went to his room, I didn't know, I, I really lost. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, I, I, because I was so excited that the bill has been passed. But he said, that's only one thing you asked. What about the second one, the insurance? The insurance he first wrote, one, zero, 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 looked at him, put another zero, 10,000 exempt from tax. Later on, it was the same secretary who gave me the first permission with um, Pranam Mogaji. He privatized insurance and health insurance in our part of it. So I think a lot, lot of things that, that's happened, but what I admire is the number of people 
who have joined this to improve the healthcare today. You know, uh, look at another month. How many hospitals he has started? Like that, many, many, you know, the max hospitals, the 40 hospitals, they live along the chains. They individually, the number of hospitals that have come, especially the, the primary and the secondary care of hospitals, I think has given a lot of comfort, a lot of people. And today, even today, in this great uh, severe situation, if India withstood this uh, tremendous uh, COVID pandemic, I think they have also helped. You know, the doctors learned, they knew, apart from learning from passing an exam, you need to a lot of learning. As I told you, we, we learned how to become a doctor. You are going to become high-tech, high-tech doctor. And thank you, Dr. Eddy. I think very inspiring to learn about how with the determination that you had, you managed to overcome all the barriers. And I don't know how many, if we were to talk to these uh, young boys and girls 10 years from now, how many of them would have set up companies. And of course, these might be all uh, tech driven companies and they would have so many ideas on how to change the way we practice medicine. We're going to invite some questions now. I'm going to invite- uh, Can I add, and, uh, Anupam? Of course, of course. I, I only saw it the achievements. But I also developed during this 50 trips to Delhi to get all these. I developed diabetes. My blood sugar suddenly was 300. My, 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 my developed hypertension. My resting ECG was normal. But that was at 1957, uh, 83. Today, my BP is 140, 70. My sugars are 90 this morning. So I think you need to learn that too. Instead of saying how, what will happen to me if I want this of this? This is why I said MCAs are all, they don't kill people. You can prevent uh, all of these people who are doomed, saying that 80% will die from MCAs. I think you all must resolve. Because whatever we have done, you can do it better. I think this is what you should instill in each one of them saying, I can make a difference, you know, for people in our country and in the countries wherever they are. A doctor can make that difference because all that you need is to earn the trust of the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mihir, would you want to please ask your question? And after Mihir, we're going to have Arpita. Mihir Saxena, please. Uh, yes, hello, doctor. So my first question is, how do you think medical students can make the most out of this opportunity that has been provided by COVID? by staying at home and uh, learning clinical skills online? I think that's a very good question. And you must also uh, think, along with the, the, the COVID, we also got a great transformation. I, I remember when I came, uh, I had one telephone to the house with great difficulty. And in the clinic, I had one phone. When I started the hospital, will you believe I had only three telephones, one given by the local general manager, one given by my MP, third given by the Prime Minister's PA. Today, each of the hospitals can hand as many as they want. So that great thing has happened from technology has made a significant impact. Uh, anything and everything you can, uh, like for example, today, you are talking from people all over the world. It's happening every single day. Today, we had an annual general body meeting. 16,000 people logged in. Normally for our general body meeting, probably about two, 3,000 will come. Because it's on, 16,000 logged in. So I think this is what the, the advances that's taken place. We should know the automation, the, especially in the, the telephone sector, the, 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 it's been a great impact, and that technology is what I think we need to use. I must say, I have four great grandsons. My first great grandson, every day has eight to ten. He has a tuition through the IT using a Zoom. So I think that is that is not the difficulty, but I think the difficulty that you are going to have is how do you test the patient. So I think this is where you need greater technologies 
to also have that uh, thing, you know. Uh, our instruments will be able to give that feel and touch as coming, you know. It is making a rapid progress. Whatever we are seeing, like for example, uh, just now we, uh, we bought a CT scan, 640 slides. You wouldn't believe when I saw that. Uh, it, uh, it, it, the radiation is one fifth of what any other good CT, say 160 slide CT will do. If you want an angiogram, it's one fifth of the dye that you have to use. So I think all of these are happening. So they must use these. But with the focus saying, it's available for everybody. I need to need it for my, you know, to learn my, you know, to start with the primary subjects, the anatomy, physiology, as they move on to, uh, to the uh, medicine, surgery, and all of these. But I think the patient contact is what's going to be very important. Uh, we certainly hope uh, that will come. But more than anything else, I think, like our doctors are doing now, uh, helping patients, even the medical students should become role models uh, in giving care uh, to people. Uh, this is the real transformation that I really see because we are much more qualified than what we are, what we were in the 50s and today's, you know, if, uh, I look at uh, Shubham, the way he talks was much, much uh, higher than what I would have talked at that time. So I think uh, we've learned to ass assimilate things and use it to our advantage. And the technology is giving us greater and greater access to do many things. And in studies, it's making a tremendous effort. This is why when the college admissions were restricted to 100 students or 75 students, I told them, that's why I started what's called the Medvarsity, which will give online, like good like they said, short of teachers. I said one teacher will teach several colleges. So now I think this will all happen now. Thank you. Uh, Mir, don't get, don't get uh, stressed about it. Use your time well. Of course, the clinical opportunities will arise. After all, we will learn how to cope with COVID and continue with our lives, which will happen. Arpita. Do you want to comment, uh, please? Uh, yeah, Anupam sir. Yeah, I actually have one more question. If I can, okay, I, yeah. yeah, I want to ask to Molly Mehta. Uh, this question is that uh, apart from being clinically strong as the best skills, which is the one quality that could help a doctor to like outshine amongst the big community of doctors? Okay. Uh, I think from the day one when you chose uh, choose medicine, you must have a principle with you saying. I'm going to be a doctor, but I want to make a difference in other people's lives. And what is the thing that you can make in other people's lives? You are not going to give them jobs. You are not a, uh, you know, employing people. What you are going to see, people who come to you do with a trust. So the trust that they have is continuously increasing because the, the earlier they came with probably ordinary illnesses. Today, they are coming with multiple illnesses, multiple problems. So this is where we feel that the, the practice today of a doctor is to be very honest. Very honest to say that we will do everything possible to investigate him and then give, if necessary, as many opinions as possible so that the patient gets the best possible advice. So everything is possible. Today. Like for example, a few weeks back, we installed what's called a digital lab. In, in the West, it, it was there for the last three, four years. But today, it has made a great difference because uh, a slide which is read by 35 super specialists. So you have the diagnosis on what the disease is by the super specialists. So this is where I think you need to say, I will give my very best, which I know, but I will also use my colleagues. You know, So this is where I think... Uh, I would advise good doctors. I want all of you to be not only good doctors, but great doctors. But I have saying, put that ahead always saying, patient is first. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, team spirit, learn from each other, uh, work together for the greater good of the patient. Arpita, please. 
Um, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, my question is to Molly Mehta. So I would like to ask her, uh, what do you think are the other opportunities that are open to medical students as future medical professionals other than the clinical ones? Uh, Anupam sir, shall I uh, can I? Ask? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Give your perspective if you want to. Good to hear you. Thank Please you. go ahead. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arpita, for that question. Um, as I said, that uh, in terms of other opportunities at this stage, I see that there are a million other opportunities which are available for us, like as future healthcare professionals, from going into biotech or doing an MPH or uh, so many other opportunities in that. And I feel that you can go towards, you can take your step towards those opportunities only when you start experimenting in your, uh, you know, in your journey as an undergrad medical student. And till the time you don't, uh, you, you don't go out there, you don't experiment with the various opportunities which come to us as undergrad medical students. And that one can only realize once you go out and uh, try to get those opportunities. So I think uh, other than just clinical ones at this stage, uh, if you like, I think I'd mentioned uh, research and advocacy as you know, one of the very good experiments which can be, you know, which can be approached by us as healthcare professionals. And those, like those, them, them in itself are um, such good uh, opportunities in terms of looking at it professionally. So I think, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yes, and, yes. very uh, well done. Thank you. Can I just add one word for it? Please, please, uh, Chairman. That was a very good question. I just want all of you to know that, uh, do you know the cost of your body? How many of you know? Way back in 1980s, a professor from uh, Yale University analyzed each part of our body. They, they said in the brain, there are 750 billion neurons. He put a price to it. Then he went to the nerves and said so many cells. He went to the lungs and said the largest number of cells. We throw out only the dirty thing and from this dirty air, takes only oxygen. Went to the heart and it pumps every day so many miles. To it. And he added up for each of these prices. You know what that added price was? That it price was that each one of us, are, our human body values, $6,000 trillion. The difference between that beautiful lady and me is $10,000. So if you have this brilliant, brilliance within you, I think you should look at saying, I will do scientific research. I will do many, many, many things which will make a difference for people, not just in front of me, but for people in the world. And you can innovate. And, we, and you should hope that you will become an old laureate. That is the day I will say you have fully utilized your $6,000 trillion body. God Thank bless you. Me. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Vandana, do you want to ask your question, please? Vandana, do you want to come in? Or we'll go to Sumit while we uh, while Vandana uh, comes on. Sumit uh, Mishra, please. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, my question is from uh, Dr. Reddy, sir. Uh, that uh, junior doctors are witnessing uh, an alarming rise of uh, workplace violence in the place as well as during COVID times. So how should they deal with it? I think it's a very one, uh, one good thing. We need to see that this is reversed. Unfortunately, it's happening everywhere. Uh, primarily, it is because there is always an, in society, there are always one black dog. Because of one guy, uh, the media projects only him. And uh, everybody, everybody else who is doing all this honest work will have to suffer because of that one person whose matter is publicized by the media continuously. Almost headlines. You know, but uh, if this is to be condemned. We have taken this up very many times. There was only one chief minister of Andhra who immediately passed saying that without doubt, immediately the police must arrest him and there is a minimum fine of 5,000 rupees. Again, I think it has been taken up in the West Bengal government. They were against the doctor first, then they reversed. So it is a very sad thing because you can't say sometimes it is that you cannot save his life. Or, I mean, the relative's life. And we are not gods. But all that we know is we have done everything that is possible with the knowledge that we have 
with the instrumentation that we have, with the colleagues that we have. But with all of these, and there is a, there's no question of saying that is 100%. There's no doctor who tells a patient saying, I'm doing this surgery for you. I, you can, I can assure you it's 100%. You can say, I can assure you, you, you nothing will go wrong. That's the best. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, this thing is happening. More of us should take this up. Uh, we have taken it up several times. We have before uh, several chief ministers. I think one day in the parliament, when doctors have a voice in the parliament, we should pass this act. So I think there are two questions uh, that come out, uh, Sumit. One is, of course, violence against doctors. And I think the medical community, as Dr. Eddie said, needs to be united in our fight against that. We need legislation in every state. Health is a state subject, so we need that. The second issue that you know, you've know you raised is about suicides and sometimes the pressure of uh, the training and losing a patient or some of the other work pressures get to you. And I think it's extremely important not to be ashamed if you're feeling low. Talk to your peers, talk to your seniors, talk to your family, talk to your teachers, talk to colleagues, seek specialist help. It is very, very sad. And I know we recently lost a few young doctors in the last few months who committed suicide for a variety of reasons. And I think we really need to support each other because medicine, medical education can be pretty grueling. And, and sometimes the pressure gets to you. The important thing is to reach out uh, for help. The last question is going to come from Vandana. We're waiting for you, Vandana. Yeah, hello. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, 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 you are. Go ahead. Uh, my question is for Dr. Reddy. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is an alarming rise of cases of suicides by medical students and young doctors. How should they deal with the pressure? I think Anupam just answered it. I, I go back to the, the lesson that we all learned in the beginning. Mata, Pita, Gurudeva, Hita. So you consult the mother, consult the father, consult the guru. Otherwise, approach God. To, for your question, for why you are depressed. I think instead of taking anybody else's advice, if you do something that I think is very sad. So I think what everybody need to know is that we have this power behind us. You know, there is a mother and father who have brought us into this world. There is a teacher who has brought us to what we are today. And finally, I'm one of those who believe that there is a God, you know, whatever you name him. And even those who don't have believe a God, and we know that there is a, a super creator. So I think we need to use those. Otherwise, for each of each these different, different reasons they are doing, uh, doing this. And sometimes it's so terrible that they fail and then they do commit suicide. So they fail because they didn't read properly. You know? So they must say, let me do, bring my very best into education. And that's the way I think we should react. Uh, there's no universal answer for everybody. But I think this four, everybody honestly remember what Vedas have taught, Mata, Pirta, Gurudeva, Hita. Take their advices first. And I'm sure you will find an answer from the first person itself. That is thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Vandana. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. Now I'm going to invite uh, someone we are very, very proud of, Dr. Sudhir Parikh. Dr. Sudhir Parikh is a very well-known uh, expert in allergy and immunology. He runs a network of asthma allergy clinics in uh, New Jersey and New York. He's the chairman and publisher of Parikh Worldwide Media and ITV owns ITV Gold. So the reach of Dr. Parikh's publications and his television is to more non-resident Indians than any other organization. There have been many honors that have come Sudhir Parikh's way. The Padam Shri, the Pravasi Bhartiya Samman, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor and the title of Knights of Malta. I'm going to request uh, Dr. Sudhir Parikh, who's the Secretary General of Kapio, for his remarks. I compliment you all today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Anupam. Uh, really, uh, dear friends, let me uh, uh, tell you that uh, this uh, medical profession is a most noble profession. It will be most rewarding profession, and you you will be surprised that with the help of the medical profession, not only you will help the uh, sicker pa uh, patient, but also you can achieve more in your life. Let, briefly, let me give you my uh, American journey that I left India in 1971. That time I was a uh, uh, doing PG in pediatrics. That time one WHO consultant came to the Ahmedabad um, in my medical school, I mean hospital, and he liked my work. 
so he offered me that uh, you want to come to england so i said yes but he said there is no job i can only guarantee you job of only one month four weeks i said that's fine i will i will take my chance and he took me to london i did four weeks of uh, uh, that uh, what do you call internship kind of a work and then uh, he was a consultant at st bartholomew hospital which is like a harvard in new in usa st bartholomew hospital is the oldest medical school in the world founded by henry the second on 11th century so he said that uh, why don't you apply for uh, uh, the house physician job at st bartholomew so i went there uh, there are 14 consultants who were interviewing me for most lowest uh, job in the hospital and one consultant even told me on my face that dr parik you are here before your time because at st bartholomew hospital to get the house physician job you have to have primary mrcp or frcs so but because of my communication skill and of course help of that consultant who was also one of the 14th member i got that job and that time this is in 1971 i was only asian physician at st bartholomew hospital as a as a faculty or resident in 600 physicians in that hospital so i felt so proud so rewarding and then of course i proved myself and then i uh, migrated immigrated to the uh, usa and because of i was from st bartholomew hospital columbia hospital gave me third year residency directly i did not do my internship i did not do my first year or second year residency in usa which is very very unusual but because of st bartholomew hospital training the doctor at columbia uh, chief of uh, chairman of the pediatrics he was from st bartholomew originally so he realized the importance of my training at st bartholomew he gave me third year residency then i did two years of uh, fellowship in asthma allergy and immunology and then i started my practice within 3 years going to the usa so whatever uh, time i spent in uk what was well spent and re- well rewarded in usa and then i started my practice and in a no time our specialty is so unique and so so uh, kind of uh, unusual specialty at that time in 70s in usa so i got busy in no time so then i said now what so then i got the idea and i i uh, contacted uh, some allergies uh, asthma allergy uh, uh, doctors who are practicing uh, to ask them that can i acquire your practice if you if you are interested in retiring and that's how i acquired almost 24 practices today i have 350 doctors nurses pa and pps are working for me and i'm the largest in the usa in our specialty owned by one person and so that's the success so anything can be achieved and not only that but after that i was more after successful practice practice was in autopilot we also have a research institute today we are one of the site where we do the covid-19 moderna vaccine trial a third phase trial today so that shows that a boy from the amdabad who went to england with the only four weeks of guarantee job now i have 350 employee uh, doctors and nurses are working for me and i am the largest in the country owned by one person a uh, small allergy immunology uh, and research uh, center and not only that but then i said that this is not enough let me empower the second generation so i got a opportunity to do to uh, acquire the uh, tv channel and the newspaper so now i am the largest publishing house to uh, having four newspaper as well as 24/7 uh, tv channel and that is my kind of community work towards the second generation of indian americans and of course then involved in lot of philanthropy work and that's how what anupam described that i i got I, i'm i'm the only indian who has ma- uh, highest uh, number of uh, uh, international awards including uh, padmashri prasi bhartiya elisa allen medal of honor in the uh, usa and by by pope in in vatican that shows uh, 
the extent of or depth of my philanthropic activity. So what I'm trying to say by narrating my story that all you young doctors, you have very bright future, work hard, be honest, and be uh, and be uh, be uh, persistent. And whenever you see opportunity, the grab the opportunity, the sky is limit. So please uh, wish you all the good luck and uh, and be be a leader. And now I have 500 employees in the USA working for me, 315 medical side and 115 media side. And so you can achieve even more than me. So please do it. It's very easy to do it as long as you are honest with you and, and honest with the people. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Sudhir. All our compliments to you. But I change it in US. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Nandkumar Jairam. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudhir Parekh. And if I might just summarize in, a, in, in less than a minute, I think the leadership mantras that we got first-hand exposure uh, today uh, from, from the leading lights, from the stalwarts of medicine, be honest, love your profession, dream big, don't get pulled down by obstacles, be, be really determined to achieve your goals, uh, think of your patient first, uh, be humble enough to recognize that you don't know it all. Uh, seek expert help. Uh, build a team. Continue to learn right through uh, your, your career. Learn from people in other professions. And, as, and I think the example that we have uh, in Dr. Reddy at 87, you, you heard Dr. Reddy use the words uh, in terms of which we didn't even know in terms of technology, like he talked about Zoom. And that just shows adaptation the will to learn, the will to change. And I end by saying that as young uh, medical students, please de develop a work ethic, develop a work culture, bring in a degree of discipline. Uh, I know Sudhir Bhai, how hard he works. I know how hard uh, Dr. Nankumar Jairam uh, works. And I know that with Dr. Reddy, he gets up at about 4.30 every morning and it doesn't matter which part of the world. Uh, what he's in and he comes to work every Sunday and he does that at age 87. So that just shows the 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 depth of commitment to the profession and if, if you can take that away, the sky's the limit and we will all be so proud of what you achieve in the years to come. Thanks ever so much for joining in. A big thank you to each one of you who joined from across the country and overseas. Thank you very all much. Good, all our good wishes for the egg doctors. <laughs>